said, this is different from how people show us love. People want us to do good unto them before they can do good unto us. They want us to help them before they can help us. And they want us to smile at them before they can smile at us. They want us to do something, show that you love me, then I'll be watching after that. I can show my love back to you. And John said, God is different. He doesn't wait that you turn over a new leaf. He doesn't wait that you'll become a better person. He doesn't wait that you'll be a good, righteous fellow. If you waited, he'll wait for all eternity because there's not, there's not the strength in man to be good by himself. And he says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. It says, therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Thank God we belong to him. I said, thank God we belong to him. Because we have experienced that love. How do you experience the love? You just believe that love. Believe that love. Let me show you in First John chapter 4. First John chapter 4. Yes, he has loved you, but you must come to believe that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me in particular. He died for me. God so loved not just the world, but he so loved me that he gave his only begotten son to die on my behalf because of my sins. All those sins that the devil accused you of. And he said, you're going to die because of this sin. He said, God so loved me, he gave his only begotten son for me. That I should not perish the moment I believe. You believe that love. And then you will not perish in Jesus' name. We're looking at First John chapter 4 verse 16. And we have known and believed. First of all, we know it. That Jesus Christ came to this world. Not to die for his own sin, but to die for our sins. First of all, you know that Jesus Christ was born. And he lived a spotless life. A sinless life. He had no sin to pay for. He had no debt to pay for. He had no sin to be punished for. And yet he was punished. And yet he bore the sin. And yet he took the penalty. And yet he died. And yet he had no sin to, to atone for. Why did he die then? What punishment was laid upon him? What has he done? No, it says the iniquity of us all had been laid upon him. You know that first. That the love of God sent his only begotten son to die for your sin, to take your sins away. You know that first. Well, you know that then you believe. That's why it says, and we have known, and we have believed the love that God has to us. God is love. Praise the Lord. God is a love. And it is that love. That made him to give up his only begotten son. That you in particular will not perish. And I pray you'll experience that more and more in Jesus' name. God is love. And he that dwelleth in, in God, in love, dwelleth in God. And God in him. We're coming to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 17. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That's where it begins. There's some people, they come to join the people of God. And you see the way the people of God live. And they say, I want to live like that. I want to live a beautiful life, a righteous life, a loving life. I want to live a selfless life. You can't do it without Christ dwelling in you. You cannot do it until the love of Christ and the love of God fills your heart. First of all, you will experience. First of all, you will have. First of all, you will possess 
this cleansing love this atoning love this wonderful love of christ in your heart it is the experience of that love christ the manifestation of the love of god dwelling in your heart by faith it is that that will make you to be able to express that love of god it says that christ may dwell in you in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love it's like the lord himself because of that experience you have he plants you within his love may be able to comprehend what all says what is the breast and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of christ it starts with the new birth experience it starts with a person of a person giving himself to christ it starts with saying oh lord i don't have any love in me i don't have any righteousness in me i don't have anything in me to justify me before you and i come on the basis of your love drawing me and calling me and wanting me to be your child and then he takes us and he cleanses us and he purges us and he forgives our sins and he plants his love in our hearts and now he makes us to grow and to know the depths and the length and the breadth and the height of that love of christ which passes knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of god i pray god will do it for everyone in ephesians chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 1 ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 but be ye Therefore, followers of God as dear children. First of all, you must become a child of God because you can be followers of God. You know, if, um, let's say, for example, somebody who has never learned anything looks at a lecturer in a university and he says, I want to talk like him and be like him and act like him and do everything like him. We we'll say, No, that's not how to start. You cannot just say, I want to become like that professor, like that lecturer. I want to act like him and behave like him. You must know what he knows. Have what he has. And you must be able to say, yes, I possess that same thing. And because I possess it, I can be like him. God is love. You must possess his love first. Experience his love first. It is when that love is born within you. You are born again. And therefore Christ dwells in your heart by faith. That's the only way you'll be able to live and be followers of God as dear children. And in verse 2, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us. First of all, he has loved us. First of all, he died for us. First of all, he took our sins away. First of all, he made us righteous. First of all, he took our condemnation away. It's only after that now we can love as Christ has loved us and he has given himself for us an offering and his sacrifice to God a sweet smelling savor. But he wants us to understand that this love we're talking about is different from what they call love in the world. Almost everybody is making use of the word love. I will wish that those people would cut out that word from their vocabulary because they don't know about that word. When they say love in the world, they're talking about another thing. When a worldly man says, oh, they're talking about love. Praise the Lord, I have loved you. No, that's not the kind we're talking about. What do they have? Look at verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness. Now, we're not talking about love of money. We're not talking about love of women. We're not talking about love of men. We're not talking about theater love. We're not talking about immorality. We're not talking about lust. We're talking about the love of God that forgives, that cleanses, that purges. We're talking about the love of God that takes us away from the broad way of sin and brings us into the narrow path of righteousness and holiness. It says, but fornication and all uncleanness of covetousness, let it not be, tell me, say that again, say that confidently, was named among you. You know, there are some local churches, it's like 
and they don't know to deal with their members. You're here today, this one is committing fornication, and you're here another time, that one is committing adultery, you're here that one is, you know, having this or that. And at church, you know, they try to start discipline this and discipline that, but the thing is multiplying in their hands. And instead of everybody going back to the altar and getting saved and having righteousness implanted in the heart and having the nature of Christ that hates sin planted in the heart instead of becoming righteous by the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. All they do is discipline this and discipline that and eventually when everything multiplies they say what are we going to do now if we keep on disciplining everybody almost everybody will have to go will have to leave if that's not the solution let the love of christ come into the heart and then you will hate sin you will hate evil you will hate immorality you will hate fornication and adultery the love of Christ will replace that lust of the flesh in the life of the individual. That's why it says, when this love of Christ is implanted in you, it says in verse 3, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be, tell me once again, once named among you has become as who says, we are no more sinners, we are says and then in verse 4 neither feel venus nor foolish talking neither foolishness nor foolish talking nor jesting which are not convenient but rather giving of thanks but this ye you know that no monger nor clean person nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God? Let no man deceive you. You are vain words because, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon who? The children of disobedience. Verse 25. Husbands, are you there? I said, are you there? Verse 25. Husbands, tell me the rest. Tell me again, love your wives. You know, that will cure you of adultery, of immorality. Husbands, love your wives. If you find a married man committing adultery, committing immorality, and there's something you can tell me about that man, his mind, his eyes, are shifting away from the wife. You find a woman committing adultery, fornication, you'll find that that woman, her mind, her eyes, her interest, will be shifting away from the husband. This will kill you, married man, married woman, of adultery and fornication. It says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ, tell me, as a large the church if you love to that point in that capacity and you love that wife at all times whatever the condition you're going to find that he keeps you away from sin and those of us who are not married when you love christ and you love god with all your heart all your soul and all your mind there'll be no part there'll be no vacancy in your heart to love immorality or to do evil love the lord all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. It says, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And he gave himself for it, that she might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church. Is it possible to be a glorious church? I said, is it possible to be a glorious church? And you, you know, sometimes the way some people talk, and they say, hey, you know our pastor? He's a perfectionist. He wants a holy church, a righteous church, a glorious church. And then you say, and they say, you know, how can a church be as large as this? And then you're going to have a spotless church, a glorious church. Wouldn't somebody go and counsel our pastor and tell him to stop knocking his head on the wall? And all this holiness, holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Once the church becomes large, with all these young, young people, and with all these adults, it's impossible to be holy all through and through. That's the devil talking. I said, that's the devil talking. I will not listen to the devil. I said, I will not listen to the devil. 
this church shall be holy. Amen. This church shall be pure. Amen. To the surprise and to the confusion of the people that think God is not mighty enough and God is not powerful enough to cleanse this church, this church will be a model of holiness. Amen. It says in verse 27 that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Number one, we experience the love of God in our hearts. After that experience, then we go to point number two, expressing his love from the heart. Expressing his love from the heart. Number one, he plants that love in the heart. And because he plants seeds in the heart, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, it is what is in the heart that will come out in the mouth, that will come out in the life. We're looking at Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. O generation of vipers, how can ye be evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. It's what's in the heart that is expressed through the mouth and through the life. And when God plants His love in our heart, that is what will be expressed in Second Chronic, Second Corinthians, chapter five, verse fourteen. Second Corinthians, chapter five, verse fourteen. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because with us judge that if one died for all, then we are all dead. For with us judge that if one Christ has died for all of us, now all should be dead. That means you are dead to self-interest. You are dead to self-ambition self or selfish ambition. You are dead to everything that wants to attract self. You are not a self-seeking man, a self-seeking woman anymore. Because Christ died. He shared his love in our hearts. That now we are dead to all those things. In verse 15. And that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. We're not living unto ourselves anymore. And you know, it's selfishness that makes a man to think about himself every time. His convenience, his pleasure, his interest, his progress, his success, his gain, his whatever. And they're thinking about only what they want. And that's what is called selfish ambition. That's what is called selfish concentration you concentrate concentrate on yourself alone but here it says you are dead to sell that because Christ died for you and you have experienced that love of Christ now what is coming out of you is the manifestation of love towards all the people and that she died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves but unto him that died for them and rose again. That your reason for living now, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Your reason for living now will be you just want to live to the Lord. And you want to express the life of Christ, which is the life of love, from your heart unto people around you. Because if you show that love unto other people, you're showing each unto Christ. What you've done for the saints, for the least of the children of God, you have done unto me, Christ said. In Romans chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 9. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Let love be without hypocrisy. 
Let love be without pretense. Let it be sincere. Let it be honest. Let it be transparent. Let it be a kind of love we can see through. Let it be a kind of love that doesn't have any secret ambition behind it. It says, let love be without dissimulation. Can I remind you once again, it is by this kind of unselfish love that will know that you are truly born again. You know, anybody can say, I'm born again, show us the fruit. Anybody can say, I'm a child of God, demonstrate it. Anybody can say, I love the Lord, I love the people of God, stop talking and let us see it in your life.